Salutations, I'm Green, and welcome to Positive Leftist News. Are you depressed, feeling low, feeling insecure about the future of the world? Well, doomers be gone, because we here at PLN make it our duty to dig through all of the dark and depressing news of the world to find those shining diamonds of positivity to brighten your day. Indigenous women leaders and more than 200 advocacy organizations have penned a letter to the Biden administration demanding that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers block federal permits for expansion of Endrich Line 5, a 645-mile-long pipeline that currently transports millions of gallons of crude oil and natural gas per day from Wisconsin to Ontario, Canada. This expansion would continue to threaten to irreversibly damage the Great Lakes, hundreds of waterways and ecosystems, and further impact indigenous land rights and access to clean drinking water. This pipeline has already spilled at least 1.1 million gallons of oil in 29 separate incidences. That's a lot of incidences. In the last few decades, the Army Corps and the Biden administration must put people over profit, said Janan Cornstalk, citizen of Little Traverse Bay Band Odawa Indians. Allowing Line 5 to proceed is cultural genocide. The disturbance goes deeper than you are hearing. The water is our relative and we will do whatever it takes to protect our water. Solidarity and heartfelt gratitude to all the land and water protectors worldwide for fighting tooth and fucking nail to protect all our relatives from the rapacious destruction wrought by colonial capitalism. Starbucks workers have been working hard to agitate, organize, and unionize, with four additional stores winning their elections in Eugene, Oregon, two stores winning their, their election in California, and another in Michigan. There are now well over 60 unionized Starbucks stores in 17 states across the United States. The stores in California and Michigan won by a landslide, 13 to zero in Long Beach, 24 to one in Lakewood, and 15 to three in Grand Rapids. Outstanding. This despite Starbucks relentless union busting campaign that could put Amazon to shame. And CEO Schultz decrying that highly exploitative companies across the country are being assaulted by the threat of unionization. Let the ruling class tremble. Workers have nothing to lose but their chains and are coming up with big wins. We have several other union drives to report across the U.S. as the labor movement keeps up its relentless push for dignity and justice. The workers of Amherst Cinema have formed an independent union, Amherst Cinema Workers United. They are joining the burgeoning labor movement and unionization revival in order to bargain a contract that upholds the safety and security of all ACWU members. And Target Workers are joining the union wave as well. Workers at a store in Christenburg, Virginia, filed for a union election with the National Labor Relations Board. The workers behind the drive at the location hope to be the first of many for the retail chain. Other stores are working in concert with other organizations on following suit. Adam Ryan, one of the lead organizers at Target Workers Unite, the umbrella organization for Target employees seeking to unionize, estimates that workers at about half a dozen Target stores currently have active but early stages in the campaign. Workers at a Trader Joe location in Headley, Massachusetts have announced their intent to form a union, sharing a powerful open letter to CEO Dan Bain who in 2020 has mailed letters to the workers' homes arguing against unionization. The workers state, no union organizers came to us. We organize ourselves. With the same instinctive teamwork we use every day to break down pallets, work the load, bag groceries, and care for customers. We join together to look out for each other and improve our workplace together. And after five years of organizing efforts, 
450 faculty at Santa Clara University in Santa Clara, California have officially filed for a union election to improve working conditions for all. Solidarity with all university workers. More power to you. Tenants in a Brock's apartment building have reached a major milestone in their five-year fight to gain ownership of their building. The tenants began their struggle after their landlord announced a rent hike ranging from $400 to $1,000 in 2017. Bastards. That landlord surely underestimated them, and they began organizing to transform the building into a tenant-owned cooperative. One of the tenants slipped flyers under her neighbor's doors and called for a meeting at the local bar. They navigated a long and complicated legal case staving off multiple attempts by the landlord to evict them. They have now partnered with a non-profit organization who bought the building from the landlord for far less than he had paid for it. And the organization plans to hand it over to the tenants. There are still hurdles to overcome, but tenants are poised to be able to buy the apartment for $2,500 each. Over the past five years, only 11 rental buildings have been converted to this type of limited equality co-op called Housing Development Fund Cooperatives, where the tenants buy their apartment at prices set by the city and can sell them for a limited profit. What started as an informal meeting at a local bar has turned into a major victory for tenants in America's largest city. They'll be owners of their spaces and will be able to live free of the threat of eviction. Congratulations to the dedicated tenants who made this happen. Padre Giulio Lancelotti, known as Brazil's most beloved anarcho-priest, opens his church every single day for the homeless and provides them with food, and has been doing so for roughly 40 years. In addition to participating in anarchist demonstrations, he is known to engage in direct action like smashing the cobblestone blocks that the Sao Paulo mayor tried to install to remove homeless people from the area. On social media, Padre Julio expressed indignation at the oppression, which he considers unbelievable, as he took a hammer to what he called the Stones of Injustice. Recently, Brazil, and more specifically the Sao Paulo state, has been hit by a cold air wave never seen before. Just this week, Padre Julio has fed and given blankets to hundreds of homeless people. He also congregates with religious authorities from other religious denominations, including his friend Sheikh Rodrigo Jalul, where they both open their places of worship to feed the hungry. Well, it is a travesty that these actions are needed at all. We love to see the fierce dedication to justice and solidarity. You can support his work by giving donations or going to his church to provide food, clothing, and or blankets as Brazil will be going through its winter soon. L'Ambassade des Emirés is a self-run squad run by immigrants to France, both with and without papers. With the support of La Chapelle de Boue, they've been occupying a vacant office building in a posh neighborhood since April 18th. 80 people currently live there, sheltered from the streets, and are organizing themselves to fight for their rights. They want equal treatment for Ukrainian migrants as well as others, as it has been clear how white migrants from certain parts of the world are being treated far differently than the rest who are often fleeing wars and famine themselves. They are bringing attention to the injustice of having 117,000 empty homes in Paris, yet thousands of people sleeping on the streets. They desperately need funding for supplies and legal support. You can donate to support their struggle in the description box below. The Debt Collective is a union of debtors made of former Occupy Wall Street activists who are rallying against consumer debt. This month, the collective paid off the student debt of about 500 black women. The group arranged for the purchase of 1.7 million unpaid student balances at Bennett College in North Carolina with the help of its sister organization, Rolling Jubilee. Then they canceled it. Its elimination means the students no longer have to pay off debt and those who couldn't access their transcripts because of overdue bills now have access to their academic records. 
end the ability to continue their education. Braxton Brewington, a spokesman for the organization, said they chose Bennett College in North Carolina because black women, on average, have higher student loan balances than any other group of borrowers. These are the people that are really taking the brunt of the student debt crisis, Brewington said. The deal comes at a time when the debt collective and other groups are calling on President Joe Biden to cancel the federal student loan debt. Brewington said, we are shouting from the rooftops that this is something the government should be doing, not a group of activists from Occupy Wall Street. Left-wing Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador has nationalized the country's lithium mines in a bid to protect them from private companies, especially foreign investors. Since taking power in 2008, López Obrador has fought to reverse resource reforms under previous governments, which opened up the oil and electricity sector to exploitation of private interests. The lithium is ours, Obrador said, at a news conference, echoing the oil is ours refrain from the country in 1938, lithium is in high demand due to the use of electric car batteries, and Mexico is following Bolivia's lead in nationalizing its mines. Chilean President Gabriel Boric has indicated that the country may follow suit. Solidarity with Latin America's push to free themselves from neocolonialism and imperialism. On May 3rd, Japan's Constitutional Memorial Day, approximately 15,000 people took to the streets across Japanese cities, including Tokyo, Osaka, Hokkaido, and Hyogo, to protest against the government's attempt to revise its pacifist constitution. People held slogans that call for safeguarding the constitution, spoke out against the government's plan to develop an army and increase military spending by 38.4 billion US dollars and expressed strong opposition to wars and imperialism. Around 50 LGBT plus activists took to the streets of Abuja, Nigeria, in a defiant protest against the bill that would make cross-dressing illegal. The bill would disallow queer people from dressing outside their gender norms, both within and outside their homes. Those who failed to conform would receive large fines and sentences up to six months of imprisonment. Such a bill would also likely exacerbate queerphobic sentiment and violence throughout Nigeria. Annie Kayobe, one of the protesters, stated, People will lose their jobs. They will have their lives put in danger. They might have to move. The landlords might kick them out because there are no discrimination protections for queer people in Nigeria. This will have several stages to go through before it would pass, but the opposition against the bill may help stop it from coming to full force. On the 20th of May, Austria's health minister announced it would remove discrimination based on sexual orientation for blood donation. These rules have previously stipulated that it was illegal for homosexual and bisexual men, their partners, and trans persons to donate blood. The draft regulation changes the rules, has already been put forth by the government, and is expected to come into effect this summer. Adora Perez, who has been imprisoned for four years on a murder charge after experiencing a stillbirth, has finally had the charges against her dropped. She was originally arrested after the California hospital reported and the district attorney prosecuted her. Pregnancy criminalization is on the rise with more than 1,300 cases from 2006 to 2020. With the Supreme Court poised to overturn Roe v. Wade, this is certainly a scary time in the U.S., but at least one small win for reproductive freedom. Speaking of looming Roe v. Wade debacle, grassroots organizations like those that form the Abortion Funds Network have been stepping up their activism to make sure abortions are accessible to all who need them. Abortion funds are united as a network of local autonomous organizations that are funding abortion and building power to fight for cultural and political change at local, regional, and national levels. Together, abortion funds form a network of over 90 grassroots organizations that directly support 56,155 people in the fiscal year of 2019 alone. 
A lot of funds are run and led by volunteers who answer phone calls, drive people to appointments, and coordinate events like the Fundathon. Many funds also provide practical support, including transportation, childcare payments, lodging, translation services, abortion doulas, and more. Wherever people are living, abortion fund will contact them with organizations who can support their financial and logistical needs as they arrange for an abortion. To support the network, you can make a donation and or become a member using the link in the description box below. Spain's government has greenlit plans to become the first European country to allow women and people who menstruate to take unlimited paid menstrual leave from work. Dope. The proposal is part of the broader package on reproductive rights that include allowing teenagers to seek an abortion from the age of 16 without the need of their parents or guardians' consent. The government has agreed on a draft law which will still need to be passed by Spain's parliament, which could take several months. Although this is still in progress, the fact that people's cycles are finally being recognized and taken into account is marvelous. People with periods have been forced to show up and work despite any number of symptoms related to different points in the menstrual cycle for too long. Honoring the differences in working people's bodies could improve the experiences for so, so many. Kathy Hochul from the New York State Assembly has stated that she will sign the Adult Survivor Act into law. After three years of outcry from survivors and advocates of the bill, the law will enable adult survivors to file civil suit against persons and institutions that abuse them. The State Public Affairs Committee of the Junior League wrote in a statement. After three years of countless hours of phone calls, emails, coalition meetings, legislative appointments, and two unanimous votes in the Senate, we will have a pathway to justice for adult survivors of sexual assault. The trauma that survivors experience is enduring and destructive to them, to their friends, family, and loved ones, our institutions, and our very society. The battle to end sexual assault is far from over, but... We hope that the Adult Survivors Act will bring measure of peace and justice to survivors. The Labour Party's Anthony Albanese will be the next Prime Minister of Australia. It is not yet known whether Labour will have a majority or will govern with the aid of Greens and Independents, but this is a big loss for the centre-right Liberal National Coalition that ruled for almost a decade. A lot of the seats the coalition lost were in big margins, had never been lost, and were held by senior liberals. And they didn't all fall labor, instead going independent, known as the Teal Wave, and at least in one seat, the Greens. The newly victorious independents campaigned heavily on the climate change and political integrity, and all of them are women. For decades, the coalition has sowed division on climate change as a means to win government. And at this election, climate campaigners have been instrumental in its defeat. Although we don't expect salvation to come from the ballot box, it is still marvelous to see a shift in priorities of the electorate and coalition losing steam. After over six months of rulemaking, the Oregon Occupation Safety and Health Division has adopted some of the U.S. most protective smoke and heat rules for workers. Regulations will now permanently require farm workers and other laborers working excessive heat or wildfire smoke to have access to water, shade, and cool down breaks. Aaron Corvin, an Oregon Ocean Public Information Officer, has stated that we've set the standard for organizations through the nation to adopt similar rules and regulations. While no workers should be laboring in excessive heat or wildfire smoke, at the very least, there is recognition that this is not safe or just, and workers deserve protection. Though the German government has accelerated plans for an LNG terminal in the wake of the war in Ukraine, they have also unveiled an ambitious plan to accelerate clean energy transition in the heating sector. Originally, Germany's coalition government planned to overhaul heating energy laws by 2025. But due to the war, they have moved up their deadline to as early as January 2024. After this deadline, 
a new heating system installed in the country would have to run 65% renewable, which would eliminate oil and gas heaters in favor of the much more climate friendly heat pumps, hybrid and otherwise. The government is also expected to unveil subsidies and funding to ensure heat pump manufacturing can keep up with the increased demand. The Canadian bank, Scotia Bank, has exited its membership from the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, meaning it will no longer pay dues to the powerful fossil fuel lobby and will no longer sponsor its anti-science investor events. To be clear, we here at PLN are not commending Scotia Bank, which continues to invest in fossil fuel projects and impedes climate progress. Instead, we want to thank the Canadian climate movement led by Indigenous people and environmentalist activist groups for their work in making the future safer for all of us. Scotia Bank was the last major bank to leave CAP, C-A-P-P, sending a clear signal to investors that fossil fuels are on their way out. Portugal has built a massive floating solar plant the size of four soccer fields. It is Europe's largest floating solar park, and once activated in July, it will provide power to 1,500 homes. Portugal's largest utility, EDP, plans to expand the project with a second floating park that would be dramatically larger. With abundant energy shining upon us day by day, it is truly a testament to the absurdity of colonial capitalism that we've destroyed so much and waged so many imperialist wars to keep burning fossil fuels. National Dietary Survey between 2003 and 2018 has found that the U.S. adults have been eating less animal-based products, which has led to 35% decrease in dietary carbon emissions over 15 years. The evidence showed a gradual shift away from animal-based products. However, the most significant cause of decline was a reduction in daily beef consumption by an average of 40% per person accounting for almost half of the diet-related reduction in emissions. A study conducted by the U.S. Department of Agriculture has also found that the consumption of food like legumes and corn has increased in recent years. While this consumption shift does not tackle the systemic causes of animal exploitation and climate change, it is certainly a hopeful step in the right direction. Comrades, if you have good news from the current month, please send your stories to totalliberationpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you, Javi, for the positive news jams. Thank you to Cosmo for the positive news background. Thank you to Mexi, Nick, Catherine, Ash, and Sebastian for script writing. And thank you to JC for editing this video. We're hoping to expand our team and therefore our Patreon. So if you'd like to support the show, please go on to patreon.com slash positive news. You can also give us a one-time tip donation. The link is in the description box below.